Hello and welcome to COVID Conversations here on WNCU 90.7 FM streaming on YouTube, on Facebook, and Instagram. I'm your host, Kimberly Pierce Cartwright. I'm the News and Public Affairs Director at WNCU, and we're using the Zoom platform, as always, to talk about how COVID-19 is affecting our world. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and during the month of May, Dr. Michelle Cotton Laws, Chief Executive Officer of the North Carolina Medical Society, has committed to talking about mental health issues to help us cope with COVID-19 stressors, and today we'll talk about young Black children and increasing rates of suicide. Hello, Dr. Laws, and welcome back. Hello, Kimberly, and I have to do a quick correction, Chief Experience Officer, because we have a wonderful Chief Executive Officer, Chip Baggett, who you might yes. have to have he's a He's an NCCU alum. He graduated from NCCU Law School, so and he's a legal. I'm going to have to theory. say this one more time as we close. Okay. And I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to let you close yourself out. So <laughs> I don't do a double, I don't know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, right, right. Okay. All right. So um, Dr. Lazarus, welcome back and thank you always for your time. So um, my first question is, do people of all races have the same risk factors for self-harm? Actually, yes, because suicidal ideation and self-harm are not genetically or, um, you know, are not linked to one particular race or the other. So any and everyone has the potential of um, dying by suicide based on certain risk factors. And so that's what's key. Um, does everyone have the same um, rates of suicide? No. Does everyone die the, use the same methods? No. So there are variations in terms of um, you know, the methods that are more commonly used by one race or ethnic group the um, prevalence of it and so forth. But to answer the specific question you ask, anybody, so it's not unique to any one culture. You do see variations in terms of rates. I wanna ask you now, um, if you would talk to us about suicide concerns, specifically during the pandemic among black children. Yes, and that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, because there are differences in terms of what we're seeing and what, what um, we're seeing in terms of the, the rates increasing. So for example, um, girls, we saw more reports of girls being admitted to EDs, uh, emergency departments uh, due to suicidal ideation. And we're talking about um, teenage kids between ages 12 and 17. Um, and within that, we are seeing also, not just with EDs, but we're also seeing increases over time. We began to see an increase since 2017, some data say 2016, go back um, even a little further, a, a steady increase in Black youth suicide attempts and suicide. And we certainly do, um, see some differences by gender within uh, the black community or black race or ethnic group. Cause you know, the whole thing about race being a social construct but we won't go there. So COVID exacerbated um, the risk, increased the risk of suicidal ideation because it did several things. Again, going back to what we talked about before, social isolation or social distancing so kids didn't have the outlets. They couldn't run across the street to a friend's house or up the street or spend the night over or um, hang out at the mall, right? Because malls shut down. Everything at the beginning of the pandemic shut down. So that social isolation, what does that, what did that, and social distancing, that created social isolation. So what did that do? That forced kids to, you know, increase use of um, their electronic gadgets and internet access, uh, accessing different social media. Um, and through that, getting fed all kinds of negative information or information that was not healthy for them mentally. And so a, a child who was already struggling with self-esteem may see someone um, on do a TikTok video, criticizing ugly kids, right? 
and then thinking, oh my God, I'm ugly and seeing all the comments about ugly kids, right? And it's all, it's all relative and subjective. You, and I tell every child, you're beautiful, right? But some kids have internalized this negative perception of themselves based on what they see in mainstream media and social media, and then also what's reinforced in our culture as a whole. And it's not just children, but it's also adults. But so black kids, so, so kids in general started um, feeding too much off of negative social media content. And that reflected in how they began to see themselves. And then also they began to see more and more kids stories about kids committing suicide. And so um, thinking, oh, well, this must, it, this is, the, I, I have a group that I, I can identify with. Um, this is my, this is my community. This is my, 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 my group, right? And so um, that increased the risk of one, not reaching out, but following through on suicidal ideation. So I, I you know, um, to take Miss, um, Miss USA, um, Chrisley, um, uh, Chesley Chris, and then Arlena Miller, um, from who was the Southern University cheerleader who committed suicide. Very beautiful young women, right? I was looking at some of the TikTok responses and, and, and it, was, it was like people were set thinking, oh my gosh, they're so beautiful. I thought about it too, you know? And so it sort of prompted people to say, you know, give them a license to say, I've thought about it too. That's good. And it, it, it can also have also a, a different effect where people say, oh, well, if they did it, I may as well too. And so we've got to um, know how to make sure that we wrap resources and good information and conversation around not just kids, but your older adults too, but um, in this instance, kids to answer your question. So that's some of the things. And then COVID also forced kids into situations to stay in homes where it wasn't healthy. It wasn't healthy. And that increased anxiety and depression. Um, abusive homes, homes where they were just chaotic, Home, houses of horror. And that's the sad thing about it. We, these homes of horror stay hidden unless DSS is called in or unless a tragedy, a horrific tragedy, a child is killed, a child remains or found. And I'm not saying this to, to bring anybody down, but that's, that's, that's what some kids were dealing with. And so how do you escape when you can't escape? You decide maybe it's best to check out. And, and, I, and I, I'll stay with the two examples that are in my, my spirit the most these days. And that is um, Chesley, Chris, and Arlena's, um, the Southern University cheerleaders. Because they, the Southern University cheerleader, she said, I've been dead for a long time inside. How many kids feel that way? How many young people? You're, you're not even 21 yet. Or you're just 21. And you said, I've been dead for a long time inside. And then with Chesley Chris, her mom on, um, and I encourage people to watch that, that segment of Red Table Talk with her mom. And she's a North Carolina native. So, um, so, so there was a Red Table Talk with Jada and her crew, her mom and her daughter. Um, and they interviewed, they had Chesley Chris' mom on there. And Chesley Chris' mom read the letter a text message that she had sent to her before she, she died by SIP, took her life. And, and it said, I don't, I don't wanna leave, I just want the pain to go away. And so that's the other thing that we have to think about is how do young people and adults, cause I had a family member to die by suicide. How do we, and my sister was killed in a murder suicide. And so how do we, how do we normalize the conversation of not feeling okay or not or feeling dead inside or feeling pain internally, emotionally, psychologically every day? And 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 COVID 
was created all of these kinds of factors that came together in different people's lives, loneliness, seeing death all the time, hearing and learning about death all the time. If it wasn't somebody dying from suicide, it was somebody dying from COVID. So death became the focal point. And kids who were thinking about it gravitate, move to, you know, regress to move towards that as, as okay. And then um, isolation and then being trapped in, in um, or in situations where you don't have, I'm not in school. So I can't tell my teacher that, that my dad is beating my mom or my mom is beating my dad every day, every night. I'm not in school. So I can't go and say, hey, I can't eat breakfast or lunch or dinner and say, hey, you know, we have not had food in the house for a while now. Or I'm experiencing some type of trauma, sexual trauma, physical trauma, psychological trauma. And it's not just it's not just the ones that we think about often that, that are the egregious ones that kids had to deal with that increase their depression, anxiety, that increase also suicidal ideation, like sexual trauma, molestation, rape, incest, all of that, or physical trauma, physical abuse, and so forth. It was also psychological and emotional. Some kids are yelled at every single day all every hour on the hour because they I say they're living with parents who've been traumatized and unhealed and unhealthy and they haven't gotten mental health work treatment so I, I want to jump in here and um, um switch gears just a little bit and this is just making my heart so heavy so let me read this to you um and it has to do with parents and listening a young man says to his father let me go see a therapist my head's not right I'm having these thoughts of killing myself um, and that you all would be better without me here in the home. And then the father's response is, that's not true. We love you, but you want to talk to somebody and tell them that they're going to think you're crazy. How important is it um, listening to children during the pandemic about their feelings? It is extremely important, Kimberly. It is extremely important that we provide space for our kids to come and get out what's on the inside. Because if they don't, then suicidal ideation has fertile ground to grow and manifest. And then the outcome. Um, so we've got to make it safe and okay for our kids to come as Naomi Osaka said, and say, I'm not okay. We've got to, um, and also we gotta stop using that term crazy because it's a derogatory term. Persons in the mental health space, um, living with mental illness or mental health conditions have, it's like using retarded for persons with developmental disabled disabilities. People who have a mental health condition or a mental illness, diagnosed mental illness or mental health condition do not like that term crazy. So we got to learn how to speak about it in the correct way that does not dehumanize or humiliate or shame people or stigmatize people. And so the answer to your question is very important that we create space and that we do not edit their story. We don't edit uh, their narrative. We don't edit what they are saying to us. If they're saying they're feeling like, to, and that's how it's come, that's their space. That's their story. That's their lived experience. And as parents and as family members, you know, we are quick to want to editorialize or edit and, and, and revise the story. No, that's the story. That's the story. That's how they are feeling. And we don't need to editorialize. We don't need to edit and revise it. We need to listen to it and figure out how we can help deal with whatever is presented in their narrative. So I want you now, we're running out of time, um, just to, to tell people about possible resources Absolutely. that they can use to get help if they feel like this is something that's going on with their young people. Absolutely. I, I just wanna say, um, I do wanna reemphasize that suicide rates 
are rising among black youth. The increase for girls is more than double that of boys. So remember that it is a devastating problem, right? Um, but we know that black children between the ages of five and 12 are about twice as likely to die by suicide as white children. So it's not just 21, 22, 12, five and 12. You've got to, and I wish we had uh, an opportunity to have a mother on whose, whose young child died under the age of 10 by suicide. She found him hanging in a closet. But anyway, from bullying, he had been bully, bully, bully. So just understand that. So people who say black folk don't commit suicide, we do. And our children are, are in, at extreme risk. Um, between 2003, 2017, um, we saw just a, an alarming increase. So where do people go? If you're thinking about it, the very first place I would send anyone is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And that number is 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. There is also, um, I wanna bring to people's attention, um, the Trevor Project, Trevor Project. This specifically, or this organization specifically deals with kids who are LGBTQ+. And that's where I want us to go at some point, maybe in July, which is my, uh, Minority Mental Health Month. Um, but um, if we think the numbers are high among kids who don't identify as LGBTQ+, when you see the data with kids who identify as LGBTQ+, Q plus, their numbers are, 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 are almost twice as high in some instances as, um, as kids who don't. And so we know that acceptance from the Trevor Project tells us that acceptance from at least one adult can decrease the risk of LGBTQ youth um, attempting suicide by 40%. So that's the other conversation that we need to have is, um, yes, we have gay kids. Yes, we have kids that identify as lesbian, transgender, and so forth. They are our kids and they are hurting. And many of them are, 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 are at highest risk of contemplating suicide or, and following through. So we in the black community have got to make space to normalize conversations about mental health and mental illness and suicide is among that. You are so amazing. Thank um, Dr. Michelle Cotton Laws, say your title. Chief Experience Officer for the North Carolina Medical Society. And I thank you so much again for your time. We appreciate your being here always. Thank you so much, Kimberly. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, audience, for watching via YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, as well as listening on WNCU 90.7 FM. We want you to follow us on all our social media platforms, and we would love to have you back next time. I'm Kimberly Pierce Cartwright, your host for COVID Conversations, and we'll see you next time.